You know, and uh, it seems amazing to me this week um, is exactly a year since we did our first online service and, uh, and everything had to kind of change. And I don't think any of us could have imagined uh, the year that was ahead of us at the time and, and how long things would go on for. You know, it's, it's been a year, that is, a year that has forced us to learn how to do life differently in, in so many ways. And, and one of the questions that I've asked myself at points, and, um, and I know others who I've talked to have, have wrestled with, is what does it look like in this time for us to be people of faith and not people of fear? Because as followers of Jesus, we all want to be people of faith and not fear, don't we? But what does that actually look like? You know, it it seems like a really simple answer to that question. But when you start to delve a little bit deeper, it's not necessarily so clear cut. Walking in faith, you know, walking in faith is often thought of as being bold and and courageous and confident and, you know, not shrinking back and being willing to take risks. You know, we can look at other people and, and think, I could never do that. I don't have faith like that, like they do. Yet what one person calls faith, another might call foolishness or presumption. In the same way, when it comes to walking in fear, you know, there are things that are obviously not God's best for us. You know, he he wants to set us free from, from things like being crippled by anxiety. But then there's the, the gray areas. Where what one person calls fear, another might call wisdom. So what does it really look like for us to be people of faith and not people of fear. Because as we look ahead at this next year, and everything that is coming, there's going to be a whole load more changes as we transition again, both personally and together. And as we make decisions together about what church is going to look like, as we make decisions for ourselves personally, for our families, as we think about what God has in store for us this year, how we can be sharing Jesus with others, I still think this is going to be a key question for us. And we want to be people of faith and not fear, don't we? I know I do. You know, to help us wrestle with this, then we're going to um, look at a couple of different events in in the life of uh, one of the 12 disciples, Peter. Um, If you wanted to hold up one of the disciples as kind of a, a typical person of faith, I think it would be Peter. Peter is bold and and courageous. He's not afraid of taking risks, of stepping up or speaking out. You know, it's Peter who leaps out of the boat and walks on the water with Jesus. It's it's Peter that, that when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? He is the one who has the courage to speak up and, and say, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. And yet a moment after he's made that declaration, when Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross and and die for you, Peter speaks up again with that same boldness. And he rebukes Jesus. So he's not on my watch. As we think then on to the night when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, with the same boldness, Peter pulls out his fishing knife and tries to kill a guy, but misses and lops off his ear. I said, I can't help but ask the question, how much was Peter a person of faith? And how much was it that his courage and his his boldness came from his own self-confidence? How much was he just a person of self-confidence? This idea that I've got it, I can do it, nothing is going to stop me or hold me back. And we get a great example of this in uh, in Luke chapter 22. 
Uh, let me just set the scene before we read some of it. You know, Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem, and, and Jesus has been trying to, to, to explain to them and to talk to them about how he, he's, he's going to be going to the cross, and he, he's wanting to prepare them for when he dies because he knows that that's what's about to happen. He, he knows that tonight is the night he's going to be arrested. But right now, they're gathered together around a table celebrating the Passover. And, and Jesus talks to them about how his body is going to be broken like the bread and his blood is going to be poured out as he pours out the, the wine. And, and, and then he says, one of you, one of you, one of you will betray me. And that starts off a discussion among the disciples about who it's going to be. And as that discussion goes on, it, it kind of morphs and shifts and becomes a, an argument about which of them is the greatest. You can imagine that. I wouldn't betray Jesus because, because this is how much I love Jesus. This is what I do for Jesus. And you can imagine the boast getting bigger and bigger about how much, how they are, how they are a per people of faith, how great their faith is and all that they'll do for Jesus. And in the midst of it, Jesus looks at Peter. And he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Peter uh, replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Peter argues with Jesus and says, not me, Lord. I won't ever fall away. Did you not hear all that I say that I would do for you when we were arguing about who was the greatest? I'm Peter. I'm the rock. I'm a person of faith. Jesus doesn't let him get off the hook that easily, though, does he? He says, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. We'll come back to that in a, in a moment. The question here, though, is, is Peter really walking in faith in this moment? And I don't think he is. I think he's walking in self-confidence. Peter had a hard time being weak. In fact, I think he thought that if he was going to be a person of faith, that he, he couldn't show weakness. Maybe you can relate to that. You know, I, I know I've felt this in internal battle at times. You know, we want to be people of faith. And so we kind of squash our doubts and fears and, and weaknesses. And, and we strive to convince ourselves that, that we can do it. That, that, that nothing can stop us. That if we just believe hard enough. In fact, we do believe hard enough. And if we just believe hard enough, then, then what we're praying for will happen. We think that somehow if we acknowledge our doubts and our questions and our fears, it will make us less of a person of faith. But you know, our greatest asset is not how much we know or how much we can do. What makes us a person of faith is not how great we are. It's not about us at all. It's all about Jesus. You know, we read in, in Proverbs 3, we're called to be people who lean not on our own understanding, but submit our ways to him. You know, as it says in Isaiah 40, you know, the verse that we've kind of had as the anchor for us this year, we'll all grow weary and weak. It's a given. On our own, we're not strong. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. It's not about us. It's all about him. And the problem we have when we make it about us is that when we're not feeling strong, when we're not walking in, in self-confidence, 
the only way left for us to walk is to walk in fear. And that's what we see happens with Peter. Jesus is, is arrested. There's nothing Peter can do to stop it. And his whole world starts to spiral. His self-confidence implodes. And he starts to walk in fear. He follows Jesus into the city, to, to the place of his trial. While he's in the courtyard and he's there and he's, he's trying to work and out what on earth is, is happening. And what, what can I do? He is faced with a question that throws him completely. Um, we read this in Mark 14. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And went out into the entryway. And you can imagine him getting up and moving away from the fire because he doesn't want his face to be so easily seen. But the girl doesn't give up. We, we read, when the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses and he, he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And in that moment, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said and he breaks down and weeps. Peter has moved from walking in self-confidence to walking in fear. He's afraid of being arrested and, and what might happen to him. He's a, afraid of the future and what that looks like without Jesus. He's afraid of that, that maybe he's just wasted the last three years of his life following the wrong person. He becomes someone who is driven by fear and that fear cripples him and brings shame on him. And just as Proverbs tells us not to be people who lean on our own understanding, not to be people who walk in self-confidence, so it tells us not to walk in fear. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says that the fear of man is a trap or a snare. And I remember, I remember when I was a child and... Um, and sometimes when I was walking home on my own, um, you know, after school or from some uh, friend's house, whatever it might have been, you know, suddenly I'd, I'd have this oppressive feeling like something was there. And fear would just kind of grip me and take control of me. And before I knew it, I would find myself running home, even though there was no rational reason for it. You know, in, it's a way that fear can obviously kind of trap us and grip us and control us. And it might not be so obvious in the ways that it works as we get older. But I, f I wonder if, if you can relate to, to Peter. If you've had a time when fear has controlled you. Has held you back from doing something or saying something. Or has, has made you do the wrong thing. You know, when we walk in fear, it becomes something that holds us captive. It, it controls us and limits us as, as we worry about what people might think of us or what might happen. And what we learn from Peter is that both walking in self-confidence and walking in fear will lead to shame and to failure. And we've all done it. We've, we've all been there. We all have those kind of embarrassing moments in the, in the past where we, at the time we were just horrified at what we'd done. But as the years have gone by, we can now tell the story and laugh about it. 
And many of us probably also have those, those times in the past that are so painful, are so shameful to us that we don't laugh about it. We definitely don't share about it. In fact, we don't even really want to think about it. The good news that we find in the rest of Peter's story is that our failures don't disqualify us. As Jesus meets with Peter, he lifts him up and he is transformed so that he is no longer a person of self-confidence or a person of fear, but he becomes a person of faith. And that's the work that he wants to do in your life today too. You see, Peter might have been shocked by his own failure, thought he could never have gone there and can't believe what he's done. And so he's just kind of crippled with this shame. But Jesus wasn't. He told Peter in advance what was going to happen. You know, we read earlier in Luke 22 that Jesus tells him, Peter, the devil has asked to sift you as wheat. You know, he wants to see what you're made of. It's going to be tough. But I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail, that you will come through this. And when you come through to the other side of the pain, you know, after you've you, 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 you kind of come through it all, you'll discover that what the devil intends for evil, I was at work in for good to shape your character. You know, that there's going to be a moment, he says to Peter, when you turn away from me. But you're going to come through. And when you come through and when you've turned back, I've got a purpose for you. A calling on your life. Strengthen your brothers. They're going to need you. And I love this. I really love this because it tells me that Jesus is not shocked by my failings. He's not shocked by your failings. God already knows your insecurities, your doubts, your struggles. The enemy is going to try and, and, and work in the midst of it to see what you're made of. To whisper into your mind, how could you really call yourself a Christian when you've done that? Do you really think God could love you when you think like that? How could you share your faith? Who are you to talk about Jesus to someone else when you still struggle with that? But God knows, God knows the struggles you're going to have. He knows how you have failed and he knows how you're going to fail. And he chooses you and loves you anyway. And Jesus prays for you that you will come through the other side, that your faith will not fail. He is at work in the midst of it for your good. And as our pride is dealt with, as our character is formed, as we are humbled and we repent and we turn back to God, realizing just how dependent we are on him, that's when we become people of faith. The people that we need to be so that we can strengthen others. And this is what we, this is what we see with Peter. His biggest failure becomes the means through which God transforms him into a person of faith. To start with, you know, it, it, it's not looking so good. Peter's pride has been dealt with and, and he no longer walks in self-confidence, but instead he's turned to walking in fear. He, he's a bit of a broken man. He feels like he's failed Jesus. He's not sure what the future holds for him. And, and fear, fear always pulls us toward the safe option. And for Peter, that means he decides to go back to his old life, to go back fishing. And I think, I think we can be a lot like Peter in that. When we're feeling low, when we're, when we're not sure what to do, when, when faith has been sapped, 
we turn to our old ways of, of coping, of dealing with things, of getting through our own way of, of, of making ourselves feel safe, like we're in control. After fishing all night, though, <laughs> they don't catch anything. And then in the morning, they see Jesus, though they don't know it's Jesus just yet, but they see Jesus on the shore, and he calls out to them, and he tells them to cast their nets on the, on the other side of the boat. And when they do, they catch more fish than their nets can hold. And, and I love this. Because this is Jesus reminding Peter of when he first called him to follow. He's repeating the same miracle that he'd done then. And it's his way of saying, nothing's changed. I am still calling you to follow me. Then Jesus cooks breakfast for them. And afterwards, this is what we read. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And this question must have immediately taken Peter back in his mind to the meal around the table. When Jesus told them that they would all fall away. And Peter jumps up and says, even if everyone else fails you, I won't. Essentially, at that time, he said, I love you more than these. And now Jesus is, is asking him, do you still think you love me more than these? And the word that he uses for love here is the word agape. It's the word for costly love. Love that involves self-sacrifice, putting somebody else first. And, and Peter replies, Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. But after everything that he's been through, Peter has been humbled. He, he's not full of himself and walking in self-confidence anymore. You see, what we can so easily miss is that the word that Peter uses for love here is the word phileo. It's the word not for self-sacrificial love, but for brotherly love. He's not bragging about how great he is anymore. He's just trying to express where he's at to Jesus. I don't know if I can claim self-sacrificial love, Jesus, but I, I love you with a brotherly love. And instead of any sense of disappointment, Jesus affirms Peter and says, I've still got a job for you to do. Feed my lambs. And then we see the same thing happen again. Jesus asks Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with a self-sacrificial love? And Peter replies, Lord, you, you know that I filio you. I love you with a brotherly love. And Jesus affirms him again, saying, take care of my sheep. The third time Jesus asks him, do you love me? He says, Peter, do you to lay on me. He says, Peter, since you can't come to me, I will come to you. I'll meet you where you're at. I accept you with your brotherly love. And this captures Peter's heart. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I agape you. And Jesus said, feed my And here's what I want you to get hold of. When Peter keeps seeming to miss the mark with his answers to the question, why does Jesus keep affirming Peter and saying, I've got a job for you to do. You've got an important role to play in my kingdom. And I think it's because it's the first time that there's no pride left in Peter. Peter. He stopped walking in self-confidence and thinking more of himself than he should. He stopped trying to hide his, his weaknesses and put on a show of bravado. God has worked through Peter's failure to humble him. And this is key. Because you can only be a person of faith 
from a place of humility. You can only be a person of faith from a place of humility. You can't be a follower of Jesus, a real person of faith, and walk around with a strut. Thinking how great you are. Or trying to present that to others. We walk in faith when we recognize our limp. But don't let it limit us or hold us back in fear because we know that Jesus is the one who carries us forwards. A person of faith is fully aware of their weakness and their failures, and that keeps them humble. But they are even more aware of the God's amazing grace and his love and his power and his promises, and that keeps them from fear. As you think back on your failures in life, I want you to know that they do not disqualify you. They don't have to hang over you. Instead, they become the means through which we experience God's grace in the most powerful way. And this is what Peter experienced. You know, as in his weakness, he turned to Jesus. And Jesus lifts him up and and restores him and establishes him as a person of faith who becomes one of the greatest leaders of the church. Your past, your past and your struggles can be Satan's greatest weapon to use against you. Or or it can be God's most powerful tool for you. It can become the means through which we experience God's grace. Jesus is saying to you today, I I know what you did. I know, I I knew you would do it in advance. And I still love you and I call you by name. I know what happened. I know what will happen. And I still have a purpose for you. Just as God had a, a purpose for Peter On the other side of his failure, he has a purpose for you. He calls you to strengthen the brothers. And you know, you can't really help others if you're striving to do it with your own strength. You know, you might inspire them with how amazing you are and how perfect you are, how capable you seem to be. But that won't really help them. In fact, while it might kind of give them that short time kind of boost to say, yes, I'm going to try and do this. What it will really do is end up just leaving people feeling crushed because they, they can't match up. And actually, do you know what? It puts a huge weight on you that you can't really match up to either. What people need most is to see how God's grace works in your life because that shows them where they can find God's grace too. Instead of inspiring them to strive harder, to be better, you model to them the need we all have of a savior. You model to them what it looks like to be a person of faith. Someone who has been humbled and knows their weaknesses knows that you can't do it all and you certainly can't do it on your own. But at the same time realizes that as Paul later writes, God's power is made perfect in weakness. 
And so you're no longer walking self-confidence or walk in fear. You are set free to walk in faith. And as we read through Acts, uh, Peter becomes a great example of this. Uh, We find that he is a man of boldness. But he's also come to realize that he can't do that or be that on his own. He's completely reliant on God. You know, that's why in in Acts 4, we see um, that he he stands before the Jewish authorities without fear. He is bold. He doesn't shrink back. He doesn't allow fear to control him or stop him from speaking about Jesus. But at the same time as the church come together in prayer, he's not there boasting about how great he is. He's saying, please pray for us. Pray that we would stand firm. Pray that we would be bold doesn't come naturally. We need God's help to do this. He knows he can't do it on his own. What does it look like for us to be people of faith? It's simply for us to be people who trust Jesus. People who have experienced the grace of God in our weaknesses, but know that because of his grace, we don't have anything left to fear. Because he's with us and he'll uphold us and he'll strengthen us and he'll bring us through. We're going to finish. We're going to finish in a moment with a time of of communion. A a time when we celebrate how Jesus knows all our failures. And he chooses us and loves us anyway. He pays the price for our failure when he dies in our place on the cross. So that as we humble ourselves, as we turn to him, as we recognize our weaknesses and our need for forgiveness. As we make him king. He lifts us up. And makes us new. Our past was dealt with and we become a new creation. And I want to encourage you to use this time just to bring to God the things of your past that might cause you to feel shame. Be real and honest with him about about where you've been walking in self-confidence and relying on yourself and where you've been walking in fear. And it's been a trap and a snare that's, that's held you back. Humble yourself before him. Because none of it takes him by surprise. He knows it all already. Let him fill you with his love. Open your heart to experience his forgiveness and his mercy. And as you look to him, he will lift you up and begin to establish you in his grace as a person of faith. He has great things for you. Great things that he's wanting to do in you. And great ways that he is wanting to work through you. As you simply trust in him. So I'm just going to lead us into communion. And then let's take a moment to pray. And have this space to be real, to be honest. To humble ourselves before Jesus.